Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center on a slightly dreary Monday. I will tell you that um, I am sitting next to one of the most optimistic people I know. And so by the end, uh, the sun will be shining by 1030. That is my prediction. Uh, we are here for another uh, experience in our uh, Bob and Dole series on leadership. Uh, some of you have been with us before and know that the kind of essential idea of this set of discussions is to call upon leaders from national and local politics, from business, from education, from the arts and academia, to try to help us understand what are the characteristics and the circumstances that call forth true leadership. I'm trying to understand at this moment in our um, polarized democracy, you know, what is it that enables some people to rise above the obstacles and unite what are diverse interests that are inevitable in a kind of a free and engaged society? And so to reflect on these simple core questions, delighted to be sitting with Don Graham, as I think probably everyone in this audience knows, Don has been a leader for decades in the Washington business and philanthropic community. As the publisher and CEO of the Washington Post, he has been, as they say now, in the room where it happens, covering the significant experiences of our city and democracy over a number of decades. Don is also a community and philanthropic leader. His current work with Dreamers, which is something we're going to focus on here uh, today, I think um, really speaks to a lot of the imagination about the future of this country. And, um, my hope, Don, is to kind of start there and then go Benjamin Buttons, kind of go back in time through your life a little bit and try to understand what are the experiences that you have had that have informed this commitment. And just to close the opening, I uh, always want to remind us how proud we are to be honoring Bob and Elizabeth Dole in this series. Bob is one of the founders of the BPC, both he and uh, Senator Elizabeth Dole are proud partisans who over long careers, I think, have documented um, what it means to be a principled and constructive partisan, what it means to show the kind of courage and creativity that actually dignify differences. And they have built coalitions and relationships that have changed the country for the better. And so it is in that spirit that I'd like to uh, ask Don my first question, which is, um, what is Dream US? Well, we, uh, Jason, thank you. Jason and I had a good conversation backstage about whether he for bipartisanship, or I for the Dreamers, was being less successful. And, we are both uh, having a subtle effect, that yeah, is my view. Yeah, we're, uh, I'm, as, as, as a lobbyist so far, I'm batting zero, but I've, I've brought in reinforcements, so, uh, so we'll, we'll try to be better in the future. Uh, first of all, thanks to every one of you for coming out this morning. Frankly, you probably had better things to do, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best to be mildly entertaining. Uh, the, uh, the, so the Dream.US uh, is a five-year-old private scholarship program for the group of uh, young people generically referred to as the Dreamers, specifically those who had a program called DACA, initiated in the Obama administration in June of 2012. How many people here worked in the Obama administration? Yeah, I figured. And uh, one, you know, who was in the, uh, a deputy member of the cabinet and, and, uh, and others. And, you know, you can argue about different uh, Obama administration programs. This one was a grand slam home run. It, it, it identified a group of young people uh, who had come to the country as children, small children, most of them, and uh, had lived here, had no criminal records and no no, uh, uh, and, and DACA says, good moral character, had graduated from high schools in the United States. When we started this scholarship program, we didn't know who would apply. The average student in our program came here at the age of four. And uh, I am, spent part of my career in law enforcement. I'm a former DC police officer, although a quick scan of the room, I don't believe I arrested any of you. <laughs> Probably, probably made a mistake by not doing so, given your behavior. But, uh, but uh, I, I have arrested felons and sent them to jail and felt quite good about it. But I did not arrest any four-year-olds. And if I had arrested any four-year-olds, I don't think the judge would have been very patient with me. He'd have said, Officer Graham, the four-year-old cannot commit a crime. You don't know enough to do that. But 
I, uh, I am embarrassed to say for someone from Washington, I'm not a lawyer. I'm certainly not an immigration expert, nothing, nothing of the kind. And compared to some of the people in the room, I don't know a hell of a lot about education either, but I know this. Uh, in, I, I was, uh, Jason, I, uh, I was running a scholarship program for all the children in the Washington, D.C. public and charter schools called the D.C. College Access Program, or D.C. CAP. A very successful program because for once, all the businesses in the D.C. area, Washington, Maryland, and Virginia, the, the biggest uh, mobile oil at that time, Lockheed Martin, Marriott, incredibly generously, Roger Sands Company, very generously, F uh, Freddie, the, Freddie Mac, much, much bigger and more philanthropic then than now. Everybody chipped in for scholarships for these D.C. kids because we were out of state everywhere. And Congress wonderfully, got a former member of Congress here in the front row in John Tanner, Passed a, uh, passed a bill unanimously giving these kids scholarships that paid part of the difference between in-state and out-of-state tuition, still going. But uh, in 2002, the head of that program said, Don, we've got two kids at Bell High School who are not citizens. Their, their parents are undocumented immigrants, so they can't go to college. And I said, well, we should certainly give them counseling like we do everyone else, and we should give them our little $2,000 scholarships. But what else, you know? How can we, how could we help them get to college? And she looked at it and never came up with a good answer. Uh, years later, more and more kids from DC enrolled in college. We were very proud of the results of the program. Years later, I met uh, the principal at Bell, Maria Tukeva, who's been there for 25 or 30 years, who's the longest serving principal in any DC high school. And she introduced me to her salutatorian for that year, who was a terrific young woman, had done everything, you know, outgoing class officer or whatnot, and literally could not go to college. Uh, she had tried UDC, and we'll tell that story another day. But, uh, but, uh, and it, uh, along about that time, somebody in the, in the audience mentioned Henry Munoz to me, and uh, I met Henry, who is from San Antonio, and they had, 50 times the number of dreamers that Washington, D.C. had. We started talking about this. Henry knew dreamers. Or Henry is the finance chair of the DNC. And thinking in a bipartisan manner, we brought in Carlos Gutierrez, who had been the Secretary of Commerce under President Bush, and who came from Miami, where, again, there were untold numbers of DACA recipients and dreamers. So the three of us, Henry got a bunch of dreamers together with me and Carlos and a, b a bunch of supposed funders, most of whom never funded, and, uh, and some educators. Uh, and we talked about the obstacles. We, they, they, they educated me and Carlos and Henry about the obstacles that stood in their way. And then we decided, that, to show you how misinformed we were, this was 2013. Uh, DACA had been adopted the previous year, and there was an immigration bill about to pass the Senate. It never got a vote in the House. That, that bill would have very intelligently, I think, given the Dreamers access to Title IV loans, not grants. The loan program, I'm, I stand to be corrected, is profitable for the United States. So, so uh, it would, have, uh, would not have been spending taxpayer money to educate undocumented immigrants. It would have been spending money that the United States government would make a profit on to enable them to go to college and get better careers. But that bill never, never had a vote in the House. Misguidedly, Henry Carlos and I said to each other, well, let's give scholarships to a few dreamers in the interim, and obviously Congress is going to take care of this very soon. So we set out to give scholarships. Uh, we made one crucial discovery along the way. Henry introduced me to the magnificent Gabby Pacheco, who I bet half a dozen people in this audience know. Gabby was, uh, Gabby's a miracle. She, she is a dreamer who was admitted to Miami-Dade College on her 27th visit to the admissions office begging for a first semester scholarship. And I think the president of the university finally paid for her first semester. And uh, then when she graduated, she and three classmates walked from Miami to Washington in 2009 when they all could have been deported, stopping at every small town newspaper on the way and every little radio station and TV station to talk about dreamers and how they couldn't get an education. 
So uh, uh, Gabby became our marketing department since she had a huge following on social media. And we, and we went live in early 2014 saying we have a little money and we can offer scholarships to some dreamers. Miami-Dade, where Gabby had gone to college, was Miami-Dade Community College. It's now Miami-Dade College. It offers bachelor's degrees as well as, master, as, well as associate's degrees. It has 165,000 students. Uh, it's the biggest college in the United States. If you need to, a sure winner to make a bet in a bar tonight, that, that, nobody's going to get that one. It's bigger than Arizona State or any of them. And uh, why is it so big? Simple reason. The tuition in state is $3,000 a year for a four-year degree. I mean, God bless Florida. You know, they, they were, and down it's the road. It's a quirky state. Yeah, and down the road is Florida International University, also in Miami, which is a straight-out four-year university, been there for years, and that's 6000 and change a year. So we quickly learned that there were still some bargains in American higher education. We don't dream of sending anybody to a high-priced private university. We set seven, seven or eight thousand dollars a year as the top price we'd pay, and you can't do that everywhere. There are states. We happen to be in the middle of two of them, where, where college costs a lot more than that. Maryland and Virginia are among. I think they're among the five highest price states for higher education, and nobody says a word about it. It's it's interesting that that's not a political issue. So, why can the dreamers not go to college? Why is the salutatorian of a high school shut out everywhere? First, they can get no federal aid or loans. So if you talk to any low-income educator, any educator of low-income students, they'll tell you nobody would go to college if you didn't have a chance for a Pell Grant and federal loans. Second, you can get no state loans in 40 of the 50 states. Uh, for instance, in D.C., you cannot get the D.C. TAG program that pays part of the difference between in-state and out-of-state tuition. In Virginia, no state aid. Uh, third, there are 15 states. Actually, there's now 14. One of them changed their mind last week. There are 14 states that deny the Dreamers access to in-state tuition altogether. Uh, in Georgia, uh, the Dreamers are banned by law from enrolling in the five top four-year colleges in Georgia, even if they pay. So they can't go to the University of Georgia. It's just, you know, it is still, the, these are graduates of American high schools to whom these colleges are shut. Undocumented students have been banned from all the state colleges in South Carolina, and I think Alabama and maybe one other state. Uh, so these are, you know, I mean, this is, in this respect only, the, the, you can't compare the situation of dreamers to the situation of Afri African Americans in the South in the 1950s because nobody was enslaved. It's, it's just not the same at all. But it is the same in that they can't go to college. Uh, and that's, this is 15 states, including Wisconsin, uh, Indiana, Iowa. What's that about? Uh, and uh, you, you can't figure why people in these states would not want these young people to have an education. Um, uh, so these, the obstacle is no, uh, no, uh, no low-income young person could go to college if they had to pay their own way. If they, they, you can't make enough money in a minimum wage job to pay for an $8,000 a year college. You know, you, what you have to do is work and work and work, earn enough money to... <clears throat> that, but the dreamers have, their calling card is just unbelievable motivation. And what do I mean? Well, uh, on one trip to Chicago earlier this year, I met two students who are, just, who are in some ways typical, in some ways a little... Uh, one was a young woman who was the second child, second oldest child in a family where the father and mother both had died. Her older sister, then age 21, said, OK, you and I are now the support of the family. But in addition to that, we're going to save everything we can out of your earnings and my earnings, and we're going to send you to college, to community college. 
They didn't make much money, so the second sister could only go to college one course at a time. She graduated in 11 years from a two-year college. Uh, then fortunately heard about us and now is, now is enrolled in her junior year and one of our partners in Chicago. Um, we, we were at a two-year college in Chicago and we met, we went around the room and introduced ourselves and the students all said, hi, I'm from this part of Chicago, hi, I'm from that part of the Chicago, the last part of the, the last student said, I'm from Wisconsin. And I said, well, I know, you know, Wisconsin doesn't give in-state tuition to dreamers. Where are you living while you go to college? She said, I'm living in Wisconsin. I said, how do you get here? She said, on the train, two and a half hours each way, four days a week, to go to a, to to a two-year college, because she has no options in her home state. So we started enrolling these kids, and we, we tried to make estimates of how many would stay and how, what our retention rates and graduation, forget that. Five years later, 88% are still enrolled or have graduated. You know, once, once they get in, they, they almost, they, they do not typically get out. I think we're gonna have a 75% five-year graduation rate for our first class, and the second class, I think, will be higher. So they are motivated beyond belief. They want to be teachers, nurses, business people. Um, then there's grad school. That's good. Lord knows what we're gonna do about that. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm amazed by how outstanding these students are in the ways that matter. You know, if you, anybody wants an intern, you know, that will work, work harder than anybody else in the office, just call me. You know, we, we got the most motivated people in town. So that's how I got into it, Jason, and it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's, I'm just carried away with it. You know, I'm, I admire these young people so much. Well, we thank you. I would have had one or two come with me, but it's exam week at our local colleges. Well, thank you for doing it. I also want to thank you for sharing it, because I think it, um, you know, I wanted to start here, because it really seems to me, in some ways, to be a little metaphor about your commitments to opportunity well. and fairness. Um, and so if I can just now dial us back to the Don Graham story a bit. Um, you grew up under some pretty bright lights, and your family is really one of the kind of institutions of this uh, city. And in particular, you've talked a lot about your mother, who um, I think we've all seen the movie, but uh, you should all read the book, because I actually, anticipating this, knew I owned the book, and through a miraculous, almost divine intervention, actually found it in my home over the weekend, which is, if you saw my home, you would understand the significance of that accomplishment. Um, but talk a little bit about your mother's role, not just with her public life, but with you, because one of the things I found most compelling about the book was how honest and personal it was. Well, Jason Dicely said that I was a CEO and publisher without mentioning that I got these titles the old-fashioned way through nepotism and, and uh, um, I, yeah, I'm the son of Philip and Catherine Graham, the grandson of Eugene Meyer who bought the Washington Post at a bankruptcy sale in 1933. My mother had to take over after the suicide of my dad in 1963 at a time when I believe no woman was running a Fortune 500 company. She, when she took the company public in 1971, I'm, I believe that year she was the only woman CEO in the S&P, in the Fortune 1000. And 999 guys in her, she was fantastic. Post Catherine Graham, it wasn't possible to ask, can a woman run a big company successfully, you know? And she, but uh, th there are CEOs and CEOs. Some CEOs have, are a little bit conceited. Uh, and uh, my mother was totally the opposite. She was the world capital of self-doubt. And uh, that's, that's why the book is so honest. She was second-guessing herself every step of the way. She, it, it was fascinating being one of her children because equally to all four of us, you would pick up the phone and it would be her and she would go on and on about all the mistakes she felt she was making and all the things she thought she was doing wrong and, and whatnot. And she, she really feared that she was gonna do something that was gonna make paper collapse or the company collapse. So I 
focus on that because you know this is being a discussion about leadership. You know the um, simplistic imagination of the leader is you know occasionally correct but never in doubt. Right, that sense of just mm. kind of direct. And again, I'm not, I don't think this necessarily is the truth, but I think it is the it is the caricature that leadership is not about showing vulnerability and self questioning. And I, I wonder how did that influence the culture of the company? How do you think that actually influenced the quality of her leadership? A lot. She was always willing to listen. And that's a great quality at a newspaper. You know, People would call her and say, I don't think you've been fair about this news story. And a lot of time, the publisher would say, well, I don't handle something like that. You've got to talk to the editor, or we just brush off the complaint. Uh, my mother would always listen, and would listen seriously and attentively, and take the complaint down to Ben Bradley. as. You know, and, and if she felt there was merit in the complaint, she'd insist on having it thought about. Um, but yeah, you're right. You're right. She was not that type of person. She was not that type leader. But it, it did seem certainly that after listening for a while, she could reach a decision and oh, yeah. hold that decision. <laughs> well, that's what the movie's about. You know, she had to make a decision on the spot. So obviously, it's a movie. Some of it's compressed. Some of it isn't literally, factually, historically true. The scene on the telephone where she has to decide, do we print the story of the Pentagon Papers when most of her lawyers were advising her no, and the consequences might have been very severe, uh, that happened. She had to decide, do we print it or not? She said yes, and they printed it. So that was a pretty dramatic moment, I'm sure, in your family life and in American history. In your time publishing the paper, I assume you also had some challenging moments. With nothing people. like that. Nothing yeah, but, no, but nothing but like. No, what, what, did anyone know, from the administration ever call up and say, you know, Mr. Graham, you can't run this story? It's sure, well, sure they did. And uh, administrations handled newspapers and handled the Post differently in my time and in hers. And she always, um, uh, you know, think about it for a moment. If you are the publisher of a newspaper and you employ great editors and great reporters and you know that they're striving to get the truth, and somebody calls up and says, hey, here's, here's something, uh, somebody calls up and says, here's a fact you don't know, here's somebody you should interview, you take that down and they'll, they'll listen to it. If somebody calls up and says, you mustn't print this story, it's probably not the smartest thing to call the publisher. It's probably a lot smarter to call the reporter, to call the editor. But Lyndon Johnson, not a shy man, uh, uh, knew my dad real well and therefore knew my mother. And when she became the publisher, he would call her up. And some of those conversations are on the Johnson tapes in the Johnson Library and great fun to listen to. And uh, he would try to give her orders. You know, He would try to tell her that she, the Post couldn't say these things. And that didn't go very far. Nixon, the, her relations with the Nixon administration are rather famous. The Carter administration, President Carter uh, sort of jokes about it now, but he really thought that the idea was to get somebody in his administration who knew Ben Bradley and could get to him or get to my mother and tell him what to do. Joe Califano had been our lawyer and was in the Carter cabinet. So he would have Califano call Bradley and he thought that would, that would fix everything. The, 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 uh, the smartest administration that came in and dealt with Catherine Graham was that of Ronald Reagan. And it was, of course, Jim Baker who, who figured out the way to deal with the New York Times and the Washington Post. And that was, don't bother calling the Salzburgers or the Grahams. Talk to David Broder. Talk to Lou Cannon. Talk to the people writing the story. And you don't say, damn it, I hate you. You know, that was all wrong. What you say is, what Jim Baker would say is, Lou, I don't think you were completely fair to us this morning. And I know you want to be fair. But you left out this point that I, want, that I made to you. And it's really important, and here's why. And the next time you write about that, I hope you'll remember that. Well, that was smart. You know, that, that had the possibility that the reporter would listen to a press talking to. Now, I'll tell you the only story. This is a good story. I'll tell you the only time Ronald Reagan called Catherine Graham. Uh, so this is, of course, about Woodward. So Woodward is, is the best reporter in Washington and was the best reporter in 1972 and is the best reporter today. His book on President Trump is worth all the other books put together. It's terrific. But Bob was working on a story, uh, and her phone rang one day <coughs> at her house. She was in the bathtub. And her, her, uh, a woman who worked for her, Dora McKenney, picked up the phone and uh, went in, knocked on the door in the bathroom and said, Mrs. Graham, the president's on the phone for you. So 
Brenda Starr, as Ben Bradley would say, wrapped the towel around herself and came out to take the phone call and dripping on her pad, she took notes, and the president said, Kay, I'm afraid the Washington Post is reporting a story that would do damage to the national security of the United States. Yes, Mr. President, what's the problem? And he said, well, you know, Bob Woodward is reporting on a story about our most secret intelligence source. Uh, and this was a story about a, uh, a device the CIA had brilliantly come up with. You put a little cap over the cables the Soviets used to communicate with their Navy, and we could read their traffic. And it was, in fact, a high national secret, but it had been betrayed to the Russians by a guy named Pelton, an NSA person who had been bribed by them and gone to work for them. And it, that, that had been in the paper. You know, everybody, everybody knew that Pelton had told the Soviets about Ivy Bells and that that was the big thing he said. So, uh, so Reagan is saying, you know, here's, here's what's terrible about it. And then she heard him say, and Kay, I, uh, I'm afraid that the Washington Post is working on something that's going to do damage to the national security. Bob Woodward is working on a story. And she realized he'd gone through the three by five cards and was back on the first card again. <laughs> <laughs> so she ran the story twice. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, worked, we worked, but she always listened, as did Bradley. And we worked hard with the administration on that story to make sure that nothing we printed did damage the national security. We took out one or things they didn't want to see in the story for very good reasons, and we printed the story. So as you alluded, you had some anticipation that the newspaper business might be in your future as a young person. Um, you wrote and edited papers in high school and in college. Yeah. Um, had that, you know, I mean, going into the family business, was that the plan? Well, you, you had to know my father. I mean, I, I absolutely wanted to be Philip Graham. Okay. I, I, he was the most... He was such a charming guy, such a funny guy, that my high school friends used to try to come over to my house to just to see him, if you can, if you can believe it. Oh, yeah, my daughter's friends do that all the time. He had, he had, such, a, he had, he had such a sense of humor. And uh, uh, so, you know, yeah, I was, I was a little newspaper kid. There, there's some at every high school and every college still. But so then you made a um, pretty important choice, which is you did not come back from college and immediately, you know, go up to the top floor. Well, that choice was made for me. I was drafted. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm... So I, how did that experience, again, influence your sense of self-leadership? I mean, can you, can you think to that as a well, part of the... Well, I have a feeling there are other people who are here who served in the armed forces of the United States, and... One valuable lesson you learn is you're not quite as smart as you thought you were, and other people are just as smart as you are, and you meet people from everywhere and every walk of life, and you learn what's great about them. And you don't enjoy every day in the Army while you're going through it, but since I've made it back in one piece, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I'd say I'm, I'm glad I did that. I remember asking uh, Howard Baker, who was one of our other founders, just you know, what was different when you were leading the Senate and he said, we all fought in the war together. Yeah. And it was that same sense of I, just I being... I was drafted in 1966, and I think two-thirds of the Senate were military veterans. Mm -hmm. A little and less today. Uh, there's quite a comeback, though. There's a really great organization called With Honor. I ask people to look into that's encouraging veterans not just to come to Washington in general, but to come to Washington predicated upon their commitment to work with each other, which is something we have been uh, happy to support. Um, and then you mentioned, though, when you came back in, uh, I guess it was 1968, you decided to um, join the D.C. police force. So well, it, that's, that a, little that's bit. a good story, too. I, the, uh, the older folks in the room will remember Washington had a terrible riot in the year 1968. Sure. The day Martin Luther King was assassinated, Washington just broke up into uh, uh, three days of, of uh, where, unfortunately, many people died and a whole lot of buildings were burned, and many of them were rebuilt for 30 or 40 years or longer. It was obvious. I, I was in Vietnam at the time, but it was obvious to me that something was... To, I didn't understand the city at all. And I thought of becoming a teacher in a public school, but I couldn't at that time because you had to have an education degree. So as I say to my friends, I joined Arrest for America and became a... I, I told the police I would only serve about a year and a half if I joined, and they said that would be above average. So, I did. I had a patrol car in the 9th Precinct in Northeast, and, and that was also an education of the same sort. 
So I'm noticing the uh, tie you have on uh, is a uh, map Washington, of the city. Washington, D.C., yeah. I know one of the, um, I think, prouder aspects of the Washington Post is the extent to which it is read by people in the Washington area, right? People think of it as a national paper, but it's penetration in well, these local, counties. Local is, news was always very important to us, and obviously the area changed uh, inconceivably. And I, I grew up. I lived for 20 years in a city with no bellway and no subway, and it's awful different today. But do you think of it as a hometown paper or a national paper? It's both. You know, it still is. It's, uh, it's Jeff, uh, uh, they, they, it, the Internet enabled the Post to have a national readership without actually printing papers and distributing them nationally, which would have been an enormous cost. So it's, it's a nas nationwide and worldwide paper, and uh, uh, it's... it's as far as I can see, it's doing pretty well. I don't know how they're doing at the Post. I never ask. You know, I'm, we, we sold the paper to Jeff Bezos five years ago, not to Amazon, but to Jeff personally. And uh, I, I knew people would tell me if I asked, how are you doing? So I don't ask. Well, from, a, from a business standpoint, you've, um, you've made the point that even when you were running the place, you didn't, frankly, ask that much about you know, what the quarterly numbers well, were. Well, that's not true. I mean, well, yeah, well, we didn't care about quarters in the least, but we cared about that the place was a well-run business as well as a good newspaper. Talked a lot about kind of the glorious Yeah, but the, but the point about quarterly earnings, did anybody else here spend the weekend in Omaha, Nebraska? Oh, you missed, it just, you missed, a, big, you missed a big opportunity. So we, one of the great days uh, was that my mother called me up to her office in 1973 and said, have you ever heard of this guy? And she had a letter saying, dear Mrs. Graham, I bought 13.7 percent of your company. You know, and it was signed Warren Buffett. I said, no, I never heard of him. Of you? She said, no. And we both read three newspapers a day, including the Wall Street Journal. But the name Warren Buffett, I'm pretty sure, had never been in the Washington Post at that point in a, in a business context. Though Warren pointed out that it was in the Washington Post when he was on the Wilson High golf team in 1946. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so he joined our board in 1974, stayed on until 2011. If you read her book, you read a lot about Mr. Buffett. Yes. His annual meeting is in Omaha last weekend. Pony up $300, buy a share of Berkshire stock, and go to the annual meeting next year. You get six hours of Warren Buffett talking business, and uh, it's fantastic. So shortly after he joined the board, um, you experienced, I think, probably one of the greatest challenges you had as a leader of the Post, which was the <laughs> Pressman strike in 1975. Oh, yeah. um, Share a little bit about that, but again, also, how did, how did that inform your sense of responsibility as a business leader? Well, in Kate Graham's book, uh, there's three chapters back to back. The first is about the story of the Pentagon Papers, which is the story of the movie. The next is the story of Watergate, which is the story of the first movie, All the President's Men. And the, the next is the story of the Pressman Strike, and she starts that by saying, uh, this was the most dangerous uh, episode of my time as, as uh, publisher and chairman, the time that really could have trashed the company had we failed. And she deserves all the credit for the way we handled that. It was, this was not in any sense a typical labor dispute. We had, we had a union contract so bad that we basically had to take anybody who showed up with a union card and a bunch of people who had been fired from other papers for committing crimes and beating up foremen and whatnot had gotten hired and apparently conspired to stage a kind of Pearl Harbor of a strike. The, the negotiations formally went on and the negotiators scheduled a, scheduled a bunch of meeting dates for the following week with a federal mediator. But at 4 o'clock the morning that the contract expired, after holding a meeting and telling the members that negotiations would continue and there wouldn't be a strike, these 15 or 16 guys uh, beat up the foreman, sent him to the hospital, disabled every press, took vital operating parts off the presses, poured Varsol on one of the presses, disabled the fire extinguishers, and set the place on fire. So you don't get a lot of that in normal labor relations. I mean, this there was a there was a course on this case, uh, a case on the strike taught at the Harvard Business School. The union leadership coming to a union management seminar uh, said, you're, you're teaching 
students about grossly atypical union behavior, the worst imaginable union behavior. You can't teach them this. They shouldn't think unions are like this. I mean, they, the, in other words, the, the union leadership in this case was defying normal union standards. They actually sat in George Meany's office, <laughs> sat in, because they felt that uh, Meany was a plumber and did not like the idea of workers destroying their tools. So, so you, were in your, you were in your early 30s? I was, uh, I was 30, okay, and, uh, and my mother, it was very personal, very directed at her, <clears throat> and they felt and had some justice in thinking this based on her past behavior, that if you kicked us hard enough, we would give in, and she did not give in. She, she offered, she negotiated, for, she, after this episode, she negotiated for four and a half months, offered a contract that would have preserved everybody's average wage, would have, everybody would have had a job, everybody would have had a job for a long time, but the, the work rules that had, had 23 people working on a press that afterwards, after the strike was run by eight people, the work rules would have been different. And, uh, but she would not have taken back the 16 people who did the damage to the presses who had all helpfully, who had all been arrested for destroying property by the DC police, so. Yeah. You and no. your family, though, started to actually run the paper yeah. day no, to day, I, right? You lived, I worked the, you down lived in the I building? I worked down in the press room for four and a half months, and when that strike ended, we had the best educated management in the newspaper business. You know, they, they not only knew how to sell ads, they know how to work in the mailroom or run the press. Is, is it whatnot. true that your mother actually was, a, was answering classified questions? She did, yeah, no, she, uh, she, she had worked in the classified advertising department before in the 1930s, and she did it again, mm -hmm. yeah. So that, you know, that's certainly what, again, this, I, the Post amicably dealt with 11 unions ever afterwards. This particular union turned down a chance to come back. Uh, and, and their behavior had, had, had nothing to do with normal union behavior. We're not anti-union, but we were anti-arson, I guess. So I have a, a final question, then we're going to kind of open it up, so I'll give you all a little bit of warning. So, you know, in preparation for this, I've read other people's interviews with you and, you know, garnered a fair bit of press in your own life. And people say you're just like a remarkably decent guy. People say you're well, humble, my wife does, I hope. congenial, yeah. serene. Is it true? Well, I can introduce you to some people who say other things. Mm -hmm. So can Martha, yeah. We, uh, no, I mean, we've got, uh, if, you, if you run a business, you're gonna have critics and you're gonna have people who like you as well. No, but I'm I guess when I say from, from a just kind of self-possessive standpoint, do you work at that or is that just who, is no. that just who you are? Well, you can't, you know, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, great book, uh, Franklin, in his early 20s, I think, writes about his, what he views as his bad habits, and then goes to work, and you read about it every day, trying to, trying to fix them. And he has some success, but... He held on to a few of them. But we all know that, you know, you, you adults can change in various ways a little. It's hard to change a lot. Uh, so, you know, this was... Um, I was lucky to have the parents I did. I was lucky to have the, uh, I, I met a lot. Of, one thing about living in my mother and father's house was I met a lot of adults. One reason I was happy to be drafted was every adult man I met, with maybe two exceptions, had fought in the war. And uh, I wasn't going to defy that example. And, uh, you know, you, you, you quickly do figure out what kind of adult you want to be. I, I don't have any, you know, I didn't, I didn't consciously try to be one kind of person or another, though I was really influenced by my dad. Mm -hmm. Questions? We have a couple of uh, fleet-footed people with microphones. Yeah. Can someone, uh, can you tell me? Give you Mike, are. let us know who you are. Susan Irving, native Washingtonian. I remember my city burning. Um, 
I guess I had two things. One is if you can talk a little bit more about being influenced by your dad. But second, um, what made you decide after the newspaper business to take on the college access program? I mean, there are all kinds of things you could have taken on, housing and stuff, but you took on this one. Oh, that's a great question, Susan. Well, uh, if you think about it a minute, one of the challenges at the Post, in fact, you know, you, you mentioned this in your introduction, a lot of people assume that the Post is a liberal paper, a conservative paper that, you know, if, if my mother used to preside at our annual meeting of shareholders and it was a circus, you know, you get people saying, you're anti-Catholic, you're pro-Catholic, you're anti-Jewish, you're pro-Israel, you're anti-Israel, and, uh, you know, everybody has suppositions about biases on the part of the newspaper. So we really, uh, I am a registered independent. I've never made a contribution to a political party or a candidate. And uh, Len Downey, our editor for uh, years and years, never voted, which seemed to be too extreme, but, but that, was how Len, that was how strongly Len felt about fairness. So when we looked around for something we could do in the community, too many people already believed we were pulling strings with the district government, which we were not. But so we decided that helping the public schools was probably the one thing we could do that wasn't at all. Helping, helping graduates of the public schools go on to college, nobody was going to be against that. So I, we started DC College Access Program in 1998. I was one of the founders. The others were Bill Marriott and Lou Noto, then the chairman of Mobile and the people I named. Calvin Kafritz was a general, generous donor. Joe Albritton was a generous donor and so on. And we were just, with a little bit of scholarship aid, we saw gratifying increases in the number of students going to college, way more because of what Congress did than what we did. You know, when we, we did, it was, I got a one-time exemption from Ben Bradley and, or from Len Downey and Meg Greenfield to go up on the Hill and lobby for this in-state tuition bill. And uh, it, it, with Tom Davis co-sponsoring it with Eleanor Norton and Steny Hoyer, with George Voinovich sponsoring it in the Senate, who was the former mayor of Cleveland, Ohio, and knew exactly what the issue was, we got that passed. So that was how I got into college access. It, it, DC. D.C. has status problems and then has practical problems from not being a state. This is gigantically the biggest practical problem, is being out of state everywhere. And it, it's a much bigger problem today than it was in 1998 because in the 2008 financial crisis, every state just gunned out-of-state tuition. That was 100%. In North Carolina, there are some colleges where out-of-state tuition is five times in-state tuition. Woo! And Daniel, everyone thinks of the Post is a paper company, but it's much more than that. And I, I wanted, is the Kaplan yeah. acquisition, which everyone, I don't know if the folks know, but the Post purchased Stanley Kaplan and turned it into quite a bit of an empire of its own. Did that inform the sense of education as something that you were focused well, on? Well, I worked with a lot of people who knew a ton about college access and college preparation. Yeah. And Kaplan, uh, Kaplan today works with certain high schools on a, in D.C. on a pro bono basis and has worked with, has worked with high schools around the country when asked either on a for-profit basis or on a pro bono basis. Uh, but yeah, Kaplan is a, a big education company today, two-thirds outside the U.S., very interesting. And uh, Kaplan ran a for-profit university, which is another interesting story, which I'm happy to talk about and wound up selling our university, Kaplan University, not to a private business, but to Purdue, where it is today, Purdue Global. Mitch Daniels, the president of Purdue, there, there's a guy who's an interesting story. Sure. But Mitch uh, had no online students, and we had over 30,000. That was a great, a great combination. So Purdue runs that university today. We, we, run, we do the technology and the back end. Yeah. Another couple questions up front. Uh, Mike is coming. Um, my name's Elaine Middleman. Um, I don't want to start crying, but my great uncle was Eugene C. Pulliam, who was one of the founders. Wow. And Eugene S. Pulliam was. I, I knew you, them both. Yeah. yeah. So I feel a kinship to the, you. These are giant <laughs> names in the newspaper business. The Pulliams owned, the two big papers they owned were in Phoenix and in Indianapolis. Right. Uh, so Am I right? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, I mean, having the family run the paper has its advantage. I mean, for journalism purposes, that. Oh, it really does. Yeah. I mean, the family lives in the city and, yeah. and cares a lot about the city. I mean, I, I'm, th I'm talking about your family as well. <laughs> uh, but t today, I'm an attorney, but I very have the journalism blood thrown through me. And just the Wall Street Journal just wrote about how the local newspapers are in such dire straits, which and we already knew that. But when you talk to reporters, a lot of them are just so discouraged, and they just feel like they can't. They don't know what their future is, and I just yeah. and you have the two the behemoths. You have the haves and the haves not. You have the Wall Street Journal, yeah. New York Times, Washington Post, and then you have all the. You are a hundred percent right. I mean, you 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 got it exactly right. The national papers, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, charging some to subscribers and then getting some meaningful advertisers and getting international readership. Those papers have a clearer future and a more certain bunch of revenues. Again, I don't, I don't know anything about the books of the Post today, but clearly uh, they're building national and international readership. And um, those, the local papers have it really tough today. There are models. Philadelphia, where an incredibly generous man named Jerry Lenfest left a lot of money to preserve the Philadelphia Inquirer, there are certain places that are better than others. No place has found a model. There is a woman in town who runs a publication called Chalkbeat, and, uh, which is an education news site. Chalkbeat is a third subscriber revenues, a third advertising revenues, and a third philanthropy. That's roughly the model of, of uh, public radio. And she is working with a, a generous guy in Texas who's trying to set, who's trying to establish local news sites, not preserving old legacy newspapers, but trying to establish local news sites on that model. And that's an interesting model. I would keep an eye on that. Martha, did you have a question? Say who you Martha are. Martha Cantor. I was the Obama's undersecretary of education, but I run the College Promise Campaign, which is Opportunity Promise programs around the country, several hundred. Um, and so my question is, why is it so difficult for bipartisan uh, accord to be reached when we can demonstrate that dreamers and low-income students will graduate from college if they're on track, if they're hardworking, if they're motivated, and for every graduate, we'll have 39% percent fewer reliance on government resources. We will have happier people. We will have people who will live longer in addition to the amount of yeah. revenue they will pay in taxes to support their local and state economies. So, I mean, that to me has been our menu for yeah. the ROI for College Promise. Why would a community, a city, why would Dallas want to do this? include dreamers, include anyone that's going to stay on track and graduate on time, especially with our graduation crisis. So I just wonder your yeah. thoughts on that, because it's such a great case, and we have not been able to convince the public of that case. And it's fact-based. I have research. Yeah. I have all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Martha is a genuine, national, respected expert on all the issues surrounding low-income access to college. She's been a college president before she came into the Obama administration and then in the nonprofit world, and she knows a hundred times more about it than I do. But the question you asked about why we can't get bipartisan uh, uh, agreement on the dreamers, I'd, I'd ask people in this room if anybody's got an idea. 80% of Americans, 80 or 85% in poll after poll say, of course these kids ought to be permitted to stay here and to study and to work and to be free from the fear of arrest. Uh, you know, they came here as young children. They've committed no crimes. If they commit a crime, they get thrown out of the program. So what are the arguments that people make against it? Um, well, they say, I mean, there are people who just don't like the number of immigrants coming into the country. They say they're taking jobs away from people. Uh, but I think there they're talking about jobs of low-wage workers in factories and things, and obviously letting these students go to college and prepare themselves for jobs as nurses and teachers where there are shortages all over the country seems like a better idea. Uh, they say we don't want to, we don't want people to come here and commit crimes, but DACA takes care of that. They do not commit crimes, and if they do, they're no longer they no longer have DACA. 
Um, uh, it, that the argument you can't rebut is, well, if you, if you give the dreamers citizenship, if you give them status, perhaps that will provoke more people to come to the United States. <sighs> you know, the dreamers came here before June of 2007. So what you're saying is if people stay here 12 years, you know, hanging on at the end of a, on tender hooks, and eventually they get some kind of resolution of their status. If the path to citizenship in all these bills takes 15 years. So I wouldn't think that would make, men, and, and by the way, DACA does not give the Dreamers any money at all. It doesn't give them access to any federal benefits, including college aid. All it does is say you can't be deported for two years, renewable, if you pay 500 bucks every time. I have no idea well, I mean, it, it can't, the DACA, uh, the, the uh, status for the Dreamers hasn't passed because uh, when it pokes up its head, Republicans want to add other things they want as part of their immigration agenda. And often Democrats say, that's not enough, we need, we need more. So it isn't that there isn't, I think if there were a secret ballot vote on status for the Dreamers, it would probably pass by 80% in Congress uh, if no one, no one's vote was reported, but it's, uh, you get cynics, and I hope they are wrong, who say that both parties want, want the issue more than they want to help the students. Now I would, as a non-lawyer, let me tell you something that worries me terribly. Um, President Trump was ambivalent about rescinding DACA. He didn't know what he wanted to do. And I think as a New Yorker, he had friends like Carl Icahn, one of his friends. Carl Icahn has started a bunch of charter schools in New York. And I will bet you Char Carl Icahn knows everything about dreamers and has, <coughs> has told President Trump about what kind of kids they are. Every educator I know is pro-dreamer. I don't know a single exception to that rule. Uh, so he was openly ambivalent about it. Ultimately, he decided that he would rescind DACA, but give Congress six months to write it into law. Congress completely struck out. Neither House passed a bill. So why is DACA still in existence? Because three different US district courts have issued injunctions saying, President Trump has every right to repeal DACA, but he didn't do it, quote, in proper legal form. The Supreme Court will ultimately resolve this. The Supreme Court has declined to take the case this term because uh, two of those three uh, injunctions, the appeals haven't been heard by the circuit courts. In one of them in the Ninth Circuit, the judge's injunction was upheld. When the Supreme Court hears it, which will probably be in the October term, there are two possible rulings. One is, yeah, President Trump issued, you know, he had a bad legal memo written for him by Jeff Sessions. but he's got the right to repeal DACA, so it's repealed, and then DACA goes away. If, he, uh, if the Supreme Court upholds the judges, all it's really saying is President Trump, go back and write a better memo, and he can do that. Then DACA goes away, which means that the 3,400 students we now have in college on graduating <coughs> cannot work once. They have two years for their DACA expires, 5% a year, lose their status every month, and then uh, the, the teachers can't teach, the nurses can't work as nurses. And this would happen in early 2020. I don't like our chances of reaching a bipartisan agreement in the year 2020. Uh, so if anybody's got an idea, we need a resolution of the DACA issue now. But you've got President Trump and Stephen Miller breathing fire on one side, and you've got the more progressive Democrats saying, we're not for any immigration law that doesn't deal with all 11 million immigrants, which is like saying, I'm the Stephen Miller of the left. You know, I'm not gonna, not gonna let you solve it. We have time for a final question up front, and then I think Don can hang around for a few minutes to... Uh... Yeah, I'll hang around. Mr. Graham, uh, I'm Ann Howard. Yeah, hi, Ann. And um, I spent about 12 years in <laughs> higher education in Puerto Rico. Oh. and working with some of the most low-income students in areas you've not heard of. 
uh, and the majority of which got Pell Grants. So I first of all want to commend the Bipartisan Policy Center for having you here, but I really want to commend you for the Dream Us organization. I reviewed it last night. I am embarrassed to say I had not known about it before. It's fabulous. Thanks. And the story has to get out. There are more than 75 college partners yeah. across the United States. By the way, there aren't any in Puerto Rico. And they're amazing. But, well, well, Puerto but Ricans they, are citizens. So they're we, U.S. We citizens, have, yeah. that's right, since 1918. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm married to one. In any event, um, uh, this is the greatest untold story. And to my colleague from the Department of Education, I think that educators on both sides of the aisles, be they Democrat or Republican, I know that Bob Dole would want this, I know Elizabeth yeah. Dole would want this. We need to get the word out that this organization that you've established is doing the Lord's work oh, with these you, kids that. across the country. Um, I have two questions. One, uh, where is the organization physically located? Uh, number two, have you been meeting with members of Congress during yeah. this whole period? Because the DREAM Act, you know, goes back a long time with Carlos Guterres and those on both sides of the aisle who introduced it and yeah, hasn't, absolutely been, right. hasn't been passed yet. Have you been doing any outreach or has your organization been doing outreach to members of Congress on both sides of the aisle to say, look, we've got the statistics, we've got the facts, and these kids are graduating, they're outstanding, yeah. and they're going to be incredible citizens of this country eventually. Well, thank you so much for the nice words. Yes, I've been, um, let me see, the, the first, second question was, are we meeting with members of Congress? And the first question was, we're headquartered in Roslyn at the headquarters of our, the former Washington Post company now called Graham Holdings. And, but I'm the only person there. We, we, are, we, are, we are virtual. We, our president works in Seattle, Gabby works in Miami, and so on. Gabby's, uh, most of the meetings with members and most of our advocacy work is done by Gabby Pacheco. Uh, but I've been meeting, uh, my, my friend, former Congressman John Tanner is in the room and with John's help I've been meeting with Democrats and Republicans on the Hill saying what I'm saying. But uh, uh, the Democrats are about to pass a, a, a bill through the House, a perfectly wonderful bill that would give status to the Dreamers and many more people. But it will pass without a single Republican co-sponsor. At the moment, it doesn't have a single Republican co-sponsor, and I don't know how many Republican votes it'll get. So I doubt that that'll be the basis of a Senate bill. You're right. The DREAM Act was introduced in 2001, the first time I know, by the very odd combination of Richard J. Durbin and Orrin Hatch, not, not two people you would normally think would co-sponsor bills. And Senator Hatch, for his own reasons, dropped off later, and I think Lindsey Graham picked it up as a co-sponsor. So it's had Republican co-sponsors all along. But, you know, the, uh, the time is never quite right to fix the situation for the Dreamers. It defeats me. I mean, I'm, I'm trying every way I know how to try to get people to do something about it this year. But, you know, it's not the, I don't know, I, uh, some of you probably have better ideas than I do. I don't know what the hell to do. All right, so I, I can't help. We have two people who want to ask questions. If you'd both ask them quickly, we'll let Don. I'll, I'll uh, answer quickly, yeah, which I haven't. Them, and then, sir, next. next. I, I'm a I'm a congressional journalist uh, for the Hispanic Outlook, so I've been covering the Dreamers for over 15 years. The the new Dream Act that they're trying to pass now is very different than what yes. you just described. It's um, it they want to right now the definition of Dreamer is anyone who came in the United States under the age of 16. There's nothing about being brought in or coming in illegally or anything. But you're right, they have to have been here five years before 2007. Schumer now has a new bill that is the one they want to pass. It would bring, it would raise that age to 18. Anyone who came into the United States before the age of 18 only had to be here four years before the enactment of the law. So that um, raises the numbers substantially. And I'm wondering, I think that makes it more difficult. I'm wondering if you go back to the original what everyone thinks it means is young children brought in illegally by their parents. Not one of those words are in the definition of the DACA order or in the DREAM Act. But I wonder if you go back to that definition. I think most people are very Well, well DACA, you're right. You're right that the definition, I haven't read Senator Schumer's bill. I'm interested that you have. I, I saw that, that there is such a bill in the Senate. 
but I haven't had a chance to read it. But you, DACA itself is, uses exactly the terms you describe. Uh, brought here before the ages, before their 16th birthday by their parents. And in fact, a professor at Harvard who studied it said they came at an average age of six. Our scholars came here at an average age of four. I met a kid last week who came here at three months old. And her aunt told her mother, you ought to have that baby in the United States. And the mother said, well, we're not going to stay there, so forget it. If she had been born in the United States, she's a citizen because she was born here, because she was brought here at the age of three months. There is nothing she can do to change her status. Final question? Finley. Thank you for your patience, sir. Yeah, just a, a quick journalism question. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, the conversation between Ronald Reagan and your mother seems kind of quaint today. Uh, and so the question simply is this. Uh, is the doctrine of fairness, which has defined your journalism career and I think mine as well, uh, sustainable in an era when the President of the United States describes you and me and everybody else in this room who's practiced journalism as enemies of the people? Well, Finley, I, I uh, I can't remember that far back, but there was a previous president who had a list of enemies that included quite a few journalists, including, I believe, you know, and if Catherine Graham wasn't on it, it was a hell of an oversight, you know, so he's not the first to consider uh, many journalists as his enemies. If the doctrine of fairness is out of date, God help us all. I mean, my, uh, I, don't ever want to read a paper that isn't trying to be fair. And it, it, Finley, who is a great journalist with a long career as Washington correspondent of the Minneapolis Tribune, uh, uh, knows that, you know, fairness is elusive. You, you, you do your best to include the point of view of all sides, but everybody always has complaints about what you write, but you try. And then if you don't get it right, you go back and, you know, you, 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 <laughs> You try again, uh, yeah. There, you know, there's there's Fox News and MSNBC that are very one-sided. Uh, 19th century American journalism was pretty one-sided. Jefferson and Adams both moved to town and hired editors to publish party papers, basically. And when the Washington Post was sold from one owner to another in the 19th century, the changed parties when it changed owners. I mean, it was founded as a Democratic paper, but my grandfather bought it from a guy who perjured himself on behalf of President Harding when, when and, you know. So, so uh, you know, uh, Finley and I are old school. I'm, 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 uh, you can't persuade me that trying with all your power to be fair to get the information from all sides of complex issues is, is our job. So. That's my point of view. I want, I want to thank you for, for anchoring our optimism of the future yeah. and on the chaos of our past. Thanks, Jason. It's a great crowd. And uh, I do encourage you all to look at uh, Dream US and look at the immigration work on our website, too, because we have some optimism that uh, this problem will get fixed. Thank you.